Rodney Bain, and this is for Aggies Invent that we held over the November and December time frame. We actually changed a month. I don't know if y'all realize we changed a month calendar during your whole event. So this is a, something that's going to be different. We are going to be uh, live streaming this event. We've already provided y'all with the link. It'll also be up on YouTube, so you'll be able to review it on YouTube after a while. It'll be a couple of hours, but nonetheless, you'll be able to enjoy seeing yourself and I really I really think you ought to be seeing yourself and making sure that you're doing your presentations well as you know you'll have 10 minutes to do your presentation for those student teams there'll be a clock in the back as soon as it reaches zero I will stop you and the judges will allow I'll allow five minutes for questions for the judges and I will keep track of the timing for the judges as well I'll not only cut off you but as a team but I'll cut the judges off as well all right, so we're going to be live streaming this. You should have a very a great time. Y'all have made amazing progress on all of your projects throughout this entire weekend. We have been very happy to work with you and have been really generally amazed at what you've been able to accomplish. We'll have five teams, then we're going to take a short break, then we'll have four more teams. Then the judges and I are going to run and go outside for just a few minutes and talk about the order, and then we'll come back and award the prize. Third prize will be $500 per team. Second prize is $750 per team. And third, first prize is $1,000 per team. And as uh, Ken mentioned yesterday, you'll also be receiving a laptop from Dell. So good luck in all of your presentations. I know that there has been a great deal of work and a great deal of stress here in the last few minutes. We have felt it, and I know you felt it as well. I also remind you, that on Friday night at 4 o'clock, I reminded you that 3 o'clock today was about four and a half hours from Friday. Do you believe me now? Yeah, yeah everybody <laughs> believes me now, all right? That time goes by very, very quickly. So good luck to everyone. And again, welcome to Aggies and Vet. I do want to remind you, particularly those of you who are participants, that in February we will be doing Invent for the Planet. Invent for the Planet will be an Aggies event, but it'll be held simultaneously in as many as 30 to 40 universities around the world. It'll start in Sydney, Australia, then it'll move to Southeast Asia, then go to Africa and Asia, then uh, Africa and, and Europe, then to North and South America. We will be, ha we'll be opening up applications for that coming up very soon. You will have an opportunity to apply for it, but if you'd like to volunteer for it, It'll be a very interesting and unique opportunity as each one of the universities start at 4 o'clock their local time. And if you do, I've already done the calculation, 4 o'clock Friday afternoon in Sydney, Australia is 11 o'clock p.m. Thursday night here. All right, so it's going to be an interesting weekend as we coordinate and pull everything together. But it'll be an interesting view on all of the world. It turns out simultaneously we're going to be doing another Aggies event in here with the College of Veterinary Medicine. So if either one of those are of interest to you, we encourage you to come back and help us out and work with each one of those. Finally, 
Remember, we are part of engineering entrepreneurship. That means that as you finish out your projects and you would like to continue working on them, we have an engineering incubator right upstairs that will be able to pick you up, bring your team in, and continue to help you work on your project. We have funding, we have uh, space, we have mentors, we have everything that you need to create your startup. Without further ado, I'm going to ask the judges to introduce themselves quickly so that they get an opportunity to see what's going on. And if we can start over here. Perfect. Thank you very much. And if the first team will come up, we will hear from Team Viz Mill. And I'll, as you uh, as you finish up, uh, go ahead and we'll give you the five minutes, and then the next team will come up. But we'll allow the judges to finish up their scoring. Here you go. Y'all move over. Make sure you're in front of the banner. Good afternoon. We're a base meal. My name is Leonardo. I'm Edgar. I'm Pat. I'm Naman. I'm Patrick. I'm Shrey. How many of you were able to sleep uh, sound last week? How many of you were able are able to go home every night and feel safe? is because of brave men and women willing to sacrifice everything that we are able to enjoy or peace and security. Therefore, we must help them in the issues they faced. We are here to present, uh, to present you our product that will enhance military training. Our military training system is outdated. We are running out of both time and ammunition, and hence money. According to a recent survey, our veterans and high-ranking officers agree that our combat personnel are not being trained frequently and efficiently. The casualties accounted for training missteps last year were about four times those reported in actual combat. Out of the $100 billion budget given to the military to train the personnel, nearly 45 to 48% goes towards fixing damages from training missteps. So how are we supposed to match our training systems with current day technology? We here at Vizno have a solution. We bring to you our combat simulator that uses the latest VR and AR simulation technologies. Better than any other such product on the market, our product not only provides haptic feedback, but it also provides visual data aid to assist our personnel in training. Moreover, it can simulate different environments ranging from different cities globally to different indoor scenarios. <coughs> Using high level but cost effective and efficient systems like machine learning and big data, we are able to provide frequent training throughout the year, keeping our troops mission ready. We are visible, and our mission is to protect those who protect us. Our combat personnel are not being trained frequently and efficiently. Those are the words from General Frost. <clears throat> Out of the $100 billion budget the military has for training, about 60% of that goes to marksmanship. Our, our soldiers go through six weeks of basic training where they learn marksmanship qualifications. And due to lack of ammunition, they won't shoot for at least six months after, which reduces their combat readiness. The military currently plans on increasing the military budget in order to solve this issue, but we propose a new idea. Can immersive technology be used? 
parts will be talking about the design of it. Okay, so in order to solve this using immersive tech, we need to get this design requirements. It should be modular, it should be accessible and cost effective compared to the current products that the military is using for the training purposes. It also should, uh, it will cover many environmental scenarios so that the soldier can train from uh, uh, fight, fight war in, des in desert com to close quarter combat in a city. It also has to be real, immersive, and the soldier should feel that he's actually undergoing the training in the, under those conditions. It can't be just a virtual reality. And also, we are gonna provide the data to the soldiers that, so that they can know what mistakes that they make. And in order to fulfill these design requirements, we underwent with three design alternatives, using VR, virtual reality, laser tag, and augmented reality. Laser tag is just using real world practice, but using infrared guns and sensor, but it has a major problem that if the accuracy of the shots that are fired and that are captured, it's, it's not very good. So we can again go to augmented reality, which is a semi-immersive technology we can use with uh, actual real world and the virtual world, but again, you need the actual scenarios. All of this can be just uh, eliminated by using virtual reality that we are doing with a so combat real uh, virtual world simulation. Now my friend Naman is going to take you through the visible features. So uh, we have taken the best design alternative and we have uh, devised a product that meets all of our design requirements. So the main uh, feature of our product Westmail is the data analysis. We provide real-time data feedback. We provide how how the uh, we provide the accuracy. We provide uh, the flinch, and we also provide the heartbeat rate, the pulse rate, and all. So another feature that we have is portability. Our product is really very small and lightweight, so it can be taken across the country, so that it really eliminates the need of going for uh, the troops to a particular training place to get the training. So that's the portability. And we have a huge cost saving, and this we are achieving by reducing the amount of ammunition that we're expending, and also by reducing the transportation costs. So the most important feature is the quality training, because uh, with uh, our product, we'll be able to generate eclectic scenarios uh, in which people can have immersive training. They can be a part of any part of the world, and they can have an immersive training, and uh, they can ease the marksmanship. Now, uh, Patrick will discuss about the product in detail. All right, so um, our product works with physical weapon replicas to um, maintain the physical aspects of firing a weapon, the kick and the heft of a real weapon. So the prime choice here is to use airsoft weapons, which are designed to be as realistic as possible with um, gas recoil. Uh, we have a Nerf gun for this demo. All you have to do is attach a motion controller to the bottom, as in the picture, and after some calibration, it moves exactly in the virtual world as it does in the physical world. So we have a demo video. Once you flinched, so if you have a poor control of recoil, then it gives you a high value. And as you can see, you can move around the simulation freely. You can crouch, jump, or you can lie down and crawl around if you want. All right, now I'm going to talk through how our product is different. How are we innovative? from the other products that already exist in the market. Our biggest competitor that we think that exists is Strike VR. Strike VR is a company that is mainly focused on games like COD and Counter-Strike, but they have a pretty good simulation of what they can do. They have real life scenarios and they have haptic feedback. But here's the things that they don't have. We provide data analysis. We provide how much you are off, how much the wind velocity is, and how the variables are playing into your marksmanship. We provide you with details like how the scenarios change. We can, we can simulate environments in Iraq, Russia, North Korea, any country, you name it, any place, indoors, outdoors, we can get it done. And also, we are all Aggies. What can be better than that? <laughs> so 
let me talk to you through our business model. Our business model is mainly based on cost and how we are saving lives. Now, let me walk you through the cost. We are assuming that there are 15, uh, 150,000 troops per year who are training with the military. For marksmanship alone, they'll use 100 rounds of bullets, and assuming M5, M4 bullets, that cost comes up to $60 million. What our product does, in five years, it will bring down the cost to $3.5 million. So that is the biggest advantage with that. Also, as we said in the video, we are losing about four times the lives that we lose in combat in training. We are trying to get those to zero. We don't want a soldier to die just because the mistakes made in training. Now my friend um, Leonardo will walk you through our future aspects. So the future, we're aiming on the continuous improvement of our product because, because really the sky is the limit. We're currently, we're currently working on developing collaborative training uh, that, for example, will allow the, a team to clear, clear a room. Uh, we're also uh, developing and in, in improving the, the data analysis by reading the pattern by the, uh, by the users, uh, done by the users. The, our goal is to d make the experience so accurate that we'll be uh, reducing the, the needing of the usage of bullet by 90%. Now, my friend Shrey will uh, present the future versions. Opportunities. So what we are trying to do, now we have targeted marksmanship, but then we are planning on expanding into police departments, Navy ship docking simulations, and active shooter scenarios, but that's not it. So today, we want your $1,000 so that we can set up our VR studio in this building and get started with more developing more scenarios so that we can take this and help our military. We are net uh, with milk. And our motto is to protect Thank those you very much. Protect it's time us. for questions for judges. <laughs> okay, judges, you have five minutes for questions. Uh, I'll ask the first one. So on the cost savings, you said going from 60 million to 3.5. Mm -hmm. And is that factoring in zero bullets, or is that just 10%? You said you're going to eliminate 90. How did you um, those So eventually we are targeting towards zero bullets. At this point, we did include some, but most of it is uh, mainly to the cost of VR and the scenario development, so mostly time and the factors of getting a VR set, getting the locations and stuff. But yes, we have included a cost of about 10% bullets. Basically, we need this because uh, currently we are running out of bullets. America alone, it is, it is within the fo it is forecasted, many generals and retired generals, they have told that we'll be running out of the bullets. And it is, being it is, may it is just not possible to just uh, generate the bullets. And that also reduces the combat uh, readiness of our troops. The major factor is for if you have a basic training of six weeks, they just need now 30 bullets to qualify, mm -hmm. which was 60 back in 20, 30 years ago. And they don't fire any bullets until they reach the actual battlefield. So sometimes the casualty rate increases because the person cannot just cope up while you are you are doing it in a close, safe environment compared to the actual scenario. So that is that, and also with the cost, we are spending like a lot. It's a five hundred billion dollars having just allocated to the military. So the cost is also very high. Thank you. Um, I would like to add to that. Um, we were reading up statistics, and the current fiscal year's uh, budget for the military has been increased by $100 billion just because of training issues. This year, we had the maximum training that's ever. So, And they, they have actually started doing a VR and AR, but it's mostly based on the laser tag. And we already went through like how it's not the best scenario. So we are trying to develop a better version. Also, um, they are increasing the levels, like let's say to get a C you need 60%, they are making that 70, 80% so that more people are trained better so that they can fight well. So could you guys briefly explain how, if I were to just take you know, one of the most recent COD games and put it in a VR environment, right. which they're already basically built to do, how would your product differentiate, your service differentiate from that? 
um, mostly we have um, more real scenarios. It's a game-based system, right? You're playing COD, COD is a game-based system. It does not account for real factors like wind, heat. Different countries have different heat indexes that re reflect different air densities. That affects the muzzle velocity, that affects how you strike the person. So those are all the factors that we are including. Plus we have data analysis. We are using machine learning um, and big data to analyze like how how well does a sol soldier equip with a weapon and how well does he shoot so that we can give him more training. Let's say he shoots three degrees off to the left. We can develop on that and we can make sure that he shoots to three degrees on the right so that um, he gets better analysis of what he's exactly doing with his weapon. And to add on to that, um, we have physical weapons that you will be using right. instead of a controller so you get the physical feedback that you need to work on the practice. Yeah. Basically, currently we are using a Nerf gun, but we would have actual weapons which are specifically developed with the recoil, the haptic feedback, and the weight, and everything. So that is also something that we just can't put it into Call of Duty. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Take it away. Good afternoon, my name is Chris Garza. I'm a fourth year computer engineering student. Howdy, my name is David Edelman. I am a sophomore mechanical engineering major. Howdy, I'm Sean Kumbin. I'm studying computer science at Texas a and Good afternoon, I'm Sam Musavi. I'm a PhD student in mechanical engineering. Hi, my name is Christian Isenena. I'm a senior industrial engineer. Good afternoon, my name is Lee Baca. I'm a sophomore major in electrical engineering. And we are VLive. The following video contains our developmental foot footage of our prototype. Please enjoy. Long distance travel is a part of everyday life, especially in businesses. Businesses need to meet with both employees and clients in order to discuss new trends and collaborate on ideas. Over $1.33 trillion was spent last year on business travel alone, affecting the bottom lines of many businesses. Besides the financial cost, long distance travel also places more intangible costs on businesses. Time spent traveling is time that could have been used creating or producing. Jet lag and stresses from travel can affect productivity and health. Even the environment is affected by the resulting pollutions from long distance travel. Solutions to overcome the cost of travel, such as video chat, have not been able to replicate the ease in which face-to-face -face meetings allow collaboration on complex ideas. They lack the ability for users to manipulate the tangible things as they could in real life. Virtual reality is the future. It is the solution to the costs of travel without the shortcomings of video chat. With VLive, you will be able to collaborate with others as if you were face-to-face, -face, designing, manipulating, and editing all in real time. We at VLive want to make that solution a reality for you.
Now, I assume as business people, you travel a lot, right? So you're familiar with the costs of travel, not only to your company, like the financial costs, but the intangible costs, like the added stress, the inconvenience, and the time spent away from friends and family. I myself, I'm from West Texas A&M. So to be here today, I had to drive eight hours in a big truck, and I'm gonna have to drive back eight hours in that big truck, spending over $100 in gas. Now this is kind of a small example, but if we scale it up to an industrial level, you can see the burdens placed on large companies. We believe that businesses have a need to conduct collaborative meetings with the ability to create, edit, and discuss complex ideas in real time without travel. Any solution to address this problem needs to provide you several simple design requirements, such as providing you the ability to edit in real time, voice communication, the ability to upload, interact with AutoCAD, SolidWork files, as well as, as well as scan in other items. Another, another requirement that it needs to provide you is the ability to change the setting or scenario to meet your needs and also allow you to meet up with 15 people. To discuss some of the designs that we looked at to meet these requirements, Siobhan will speak next. So we initially deliberated on a lot of designs and first we thought of like why not including this with say AR which is augmented reality but then we realized that there's a lot of shortcomings to it. For instance, we won't really get a true immersive experience for for just using AR and also in the multiplayer, multiplayer mode with AR wouldn't be as immersive as using VR. So what we decided to do is we, we decided to create this virtual reality platform where people could all just simply sign up and then go into their meeting room. They could be from anywhere in the world. And we wanted to target this for two sets of demographics, which is corporates, where we could have a little bit more high-end device using the HTC Vive. And we also wanted students to collaborate on this by using simple things such as their smartphones and a Google Cardboard, where they could just download our software and simply be connected and collaborate with other students all, ac all across the world. And our solution was designing a shared virtual environment. A group of people can have access to the room. They, all the members of the group can make changes to the environment and everybody can see those modifications online and they can see who is changing those, who is making those changes. For example, consider a classroom. A teacher asks his students to solve a math problem on a board. We think it's, this is possible using our virtual classroom where we can have a shared um, canvas or a shared uh, board which everybody can write and erase the canvas. Or we can expand this experience. The teacher can upload 3D models into the environment. We can give it to the students, ask them to um, disassemble the parts and assemble it again. We think, uh, we believe this all can happen using the VLI. For example, using virtual reality room uh, Lee could be able to attend this Aggie Invent event without uh, actually being here. Another you know, thing I really want to emphasize is this is much more than being in a live Skype call or being in Google Hangouts. I take advantage of the fact that this is a virtual space, a virtual environment. Uh, as we saw in our early prototype, you can spawn interactive models based on accurate physics-based simulations in real time. Because of this, you can have events and conferences from, in, from people anywhere around the world. As well as, you might be thinking, what if somebody you really need on a team doesn't have a VR headset? What sets us apart from other virtual platforms is that ours is multi-platform. From the high-end ATC Vive all the way down to the Google Cardboard. Um, even if they don't have a Google Cardboard, they can still join the same live simulation by desktop. In a report by Harvard Business Review, they interviewed 200 managers uh, across different industries. And 71% of the managers thought that meetings are ineffective and unproductive. In the same report, they show that on average, there are 25 million meetings per day in the US. And on a yearly basis, there's $37 billion spent on unproductive meetings. We see that audiovisual like Skype or WebEx has a 20% retention rate versus VR has a 75% retention rate. I know that in, in all the meetings you're not going to be learning something new, but VLive is going to help host your meetings more productive, more interactive, more collaborative. 
<coughs> On the report by Statista, um, there are, in 2017, there were 462 million business trips completed. The overall spending on those business trips, it was around $305 billion. For Accenture, they spent around $443 million on traveling spending in the U.S. alone. For Dell, they spent around $200 million. After doing some research, we estimated that we can save 5 to 10% on travel expenses. Making it 5%, we can save Accenture $22.5 million, or Dell $10 million. And that's just cost savings. Also, another intangible savings like um, just increasing employee satisfaction for not able to traveling and spending more time with their families or friends, or just boosting creativity or color collaborative in their meetings. Um, to answer the question about initial cost for the company, uh, in order to get the best collaboration uh, experience, you would need an HTC Vive, which retail for about $500. But compared to the price of how much one day of business travel can compare, um, it's almost nothing. Uh, it averages at $300, $325 is spent on just one day of business travel, which so in just two days of business travel, I can easily pay for uh, at least one VR. And all other days that can be avoided on business travel would be put towards the bottom line of the company. And so moving forward, um, we have a couple things that we would do. We would add a real-time translator, such as a Google Assistant, that could help bridge the gap between language barriers. We would also make a way for, it to, way for uh, our users to easily scan items and put them into the virtual world, so trying to reduce the gap between the physical world and the virtual world. And we would also provide alternatives to different platforms um, to get onto our product. So, I couldn't even imagine how your schedule is looking like next week. Some of you are going to be traveling, many of you are going to be sitting through meetings. Be Live is going to make your life easier. You can host now more productive meetings um, at the comfort of your own location without, even, without traveling. Be Live makes the world more collaborative. Thank you. Thank you. You have five minutes for questions. any physical materials you might need in a virtual space. So there is that. Um, that's did, you, did you factor in any training costs? How you train employees for technology? We haven't factored in the training costs. It's something we, um, we're going to do more research on and we'll get back to you. are pre-downloaded so all you would be needing is a live connection to, towards the other people and that's widely spread like availability that's already that's available. Can, can you all briefly talk through some of the physical challenges of VR because um, you know we've tried elements of this and there are elements of this that are already moving forward right now but at the scale you are talking about it with the platform being an agnostic device and everything is the way it needs to go, but there's still the issue of basically strapping a brick to our face. Mm -hmm. So what makes us strap that brick to our face for an extended period of time? You know, we have we have meeting after meeting after meeting every day. And so there's a fatigue that kind of sets in that you won't give any time to kind of thinking about it. You can mitigate some of that throughout that process. Mm -hmm. So we think of it like as if you're taking a phone call, right? So basically you have your phone all day and this is a problem for my dad also. Like he sits in like and he has like about 24 hours of phone calls and non-stop he's holding the phone to his ears and like at some time he has earphones but like the thing is he feels that the meetings which he which he uses are not really useful or they don't really actually have such an impact but if he could just brief his team say in just 10 minutes and then show how the model should work and then point out and say oh you know this element needs some changing or something like that 
it would be a lot more easier and a lot more convenient than him sitting and talking and then for him to find out what the actual problem is and then realize it and then him explaining it to all of his other team members. That is what kind of wastes a lot of time. So we, we want to include, uh, I mean, we want to make our product in such a way that it kind of eliminates that time factor itself. Okay, so we're to the fucking paradigm. Actually, the idea is that you're actually trying to eliminate how much time you are spending. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. The next team is Visualize for Life. Which direction? Okay. There you go. Center yourself. You know, in the in a TED talk. Take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carla Basile. I'm a biomedical engineering major, and I'm class of 2022. My name is Caleb Herpin, and I'm a computer engineering major of class 2022. My name is Carolyn Nguyen. I'm an industrial engineering major, and I'm class of 2021. I'm Joshua Waterman. I'm a sociology major, and I'm class of 2018. I'm Ali Yang. I'm a computer science major. I'm a class of 2022. My name is Arturo Sanchez. I'm a petroleum engineering major, and I'm a class of 2021. And we are Visualize for Lives, an augmented reality approach to mass casualty incidents. Do you remember where you were when the disaster of 9-11 hit? Of course you do. When nearly 3,000 people died, with 6,000 more wounded, it's impossible to forget. Families were torn apart, children left parentless, a catastrophe with mass casualties like 9-11 was only worsened by the lack of efficiency in getting injured people the care they needed before it was too late. Emergency medical services tried their best, but there's only so much they can do with the resources and systems they have in place. Now imagine a similar situation, but this time using our AR system. After a quick sweep, trained professionals immediately know the health status of the injured civilians around them. Our team has developed an inclusive, technology-based system to maximize triage efficiency while also minimizing costs. Our design combines phone-based augmented reality with an easy-to-use training app. Additionally, the use of biomedical sensors helps the system keep track of the medical status of multiple injured people in real time. Now let's take a broader view of our system. Our AR app suggests possible routes for the healthcare providers based on the distance and severity of injuries of the patients. In this way, time spent on locating patients is minimized while time spent on care is maximized. Augmented reality signifies the next step in bringing order to the chaotic environment of mass casualty events. 
This technology will provide emergency medical services an optimal tool to save as many lives as possible in a fast-paced scenario. Whenever an event occurs that results in many injuries, especially severe injuries, emergency medical services, they use something called triaging. And what this does is there's a first wave where they go around and they place pieces of colored paper on all the pa injuries, injured in, um, civilians. Then there's a second wave that comes, and this is a backup EMTs, and they come and they, this, these colored pieces of papers guide them so that they can prioritize patients who need the help immediately and fast. They use a, a method called the, called the START method, and this is an al algorithm, they use a flowchart, and this allows them to efficiently, they use their heart rate and the respiration rate to determine the status of each patient. This has limitations, however. This is only, this is a one-time measurement that's only used when the EMT first discovers the patient. And this is also inaccurate and too slow sometimes. So for our design, we have two, two parts of it. The first is the first wave which is a group of individuals who can go out and put biomedical sensors on everybody involved. And these would um, keep track of pulse and it would keep track of respiration rates. And they would also, these people wouldn't have to be as trained as the EMTs or the experts because these people could use our app, which makes it much easier for them. They can just check which symptoms the person has, like whether they're able to walk or not able to walk or whether they need help breathing or things like that. And the app automatically calculates their critical condition level. So they're ranked either really critical or moderate or mild. And so the app, based on the, that information, and the app, whenever they place the biomedical sensors on the people, they can track the location of it. And so we can keep a map of where everybody is and what their conditions are. The second wave next comes through. And these are the EMTs, the firemen, the police, the more trained people. And they can just look at the app, see where everybody is, see their conditions, see their heart rates and their respiration rates. And the app can automatically, for each EMT person, it can calculate a path for them to travel to get the people, to help them get to the hospital as quick as possible and to help the people who need the most help first in the most timely manner based on distance. So the normally with the one-time one time getting their measurements. With the system, with real-time data, it can constantly be updating. Say someone was marked as a green, as mild, and then all of a sudden they turn to red. They can be prioritized over others, and they can be saved before it's too late. So in order to optimize our system, we came up, so we came up with, so we came up with some requirements for our system. So this is, so our requirements includes to be able to accurately assign all the charging statuses for all patients and to be able to continuously update all the statuses for all patients. And this serves as an upgrade from the traditional method of uh, placing a physical marker there that cannot be changed. And also to be able um, to display on the screen all the all, all the charging statuses of all the patients that are within 10 feet of a professional. And 10 feet at most of the screen is not too cluttered. And finally, to be able to factor both, to be able to factor both the patient's tragic status and the patient's distance from a professional, in order to calculate that professional's optimized route to travel. So back to the 9/11 system. Uh, well, 9/11. If we had an example such as 9/11, and say you're an EMT, there's smoke everywhere, there's dust, you can't see what's going on. There's people all over the ground, and you're looking just for colored pieces of paper on people. And there's smoke everywhere. You can't, it's hard to tell who needs the most help and where they are. Now, assume we're using our design. You just grab out your phone and you can scan, quickly scan around you with AR, see everybody around you, see their colors, see their critical conditions, and see the recommended path for where you go. You don't have to go around searching for who needs help. You can just follow the app, it will tell you where to go. And if it needs to be overridden, you can, you can do that too. So if this is a simulation and concept of the app we will implement for our first and second wave responders. Um, our first wave will focus on first the, uh, the, the first uh, button. Here first, have to check a make a connection with the about the 
the sensor, the bio, the bio sensor. Uh, once connected, they can check things like the heart rate, the blood pressure, and they can go down the smart algorithm to uh, prioritize people in a best manner. Um, and then after this, there will be a second wave, and the second wave will focus down on the uh, last two. The middle one will um, uh, check for centers near them, so those will prioritize like distance, uh, different algorithms such as also like trauma levels, um, space availability to ensure that a uh, patient gets the proper care. There's also the patient's page where it shows the most severe and near me so that personnel can assist the, uh, to their best of their capabilities. And then there's the AR version or the AR tab. Here the second wave personnel would uh, scan an area and quickly uh, see who needs help without checking papers because the, bio, the biosensor will, uh, will be, dis be displaying like their heart rate and the severity from yellow, red, or green. So the, cost, the current cost of the triage system right now is about $88,000 per person per incident. We are, our goal is to decrease that cost by 20% through a number of different ways. The, first, the main way is to reduce the cost of training the individuals and to be able to train more individuals um, in a short amount of time so that, more, so that we'll be able to help more people um, yeah, and then the another way is through um, being able to reduce the waste um, of sending the same, uh, sending too many people to the uh, to a hospital that can't hold the that the trauma level that is occurring. So through the app, you will be able to use different. Um, you better see the distances and the amount of um, how much each hospital can hold. All right, so with the medical industry booming, um, healthcare providers are more open to piloting and testing this new and promising technology. Um, we expect to take our technology in the future even to the military scale, so training um, on on-site combat. Uh, an initial design of ours was to use AR headsets for this instead of the phone, but we decided because AR technologies are currently limited with um, being able to use them in an outdoor setting, as well as the cost associated with them, at the moment they wouldn't be feasible for our products, but in the future we do plan to take our product to the next level so that it's a hand-free environment for these EMTs and whoever's using them. All right. So thank you everyone, we are Visualized for Lives. They say time costs lives and we are here to save time. Thank you. So you have five minutes for questions. I have a question, maybe I just I missed it. Um, when you talk about the biosensors, um, about my watch here, how, did you factor in that everyone automatically had one? Like how would you find this? So, um, so, so the first wave would be trained in just the main goal is to just get everybody um, have the sensors on them and everything, and so they would they, we, they would put them on there. But they wouldn't have as much medical training expertise, so their goal would just be as quick as possible so that the actual EMTs can come and help. And these are pulse oximetry um, sensors that we would help design, and um, we would distribute them as part of our app. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's part of the just kind of a continuation of that question. That, that's the first way. It's, it's pretty, um, it's actually a little technology agnostic, right? It's uh, get to the scene, it's the equivalent of the paper that you want to talk to. Yes. Right? And modernize the paper process the next way, the second way, is where the emergency responders would be able to work into it. So, did you all factor in kind of that human element and the, like, it would be quite a lot of overhead to get, you know, an industry of that size, you know, turn that, that tanker, turn that kind of corner. Yes, so we did think about like how how we would take into account like people trying out a different system and that's why as I was saying before it's the pilot the pilot trials that we really need to focus on is obviously with anything that takes into account such a mass scale there are going to be problems at first and these things have to be solved through trial and error they're not things that we can account for because the situation does change time to time so that's why I'm saying pilots are very important and there are a lot of uh, healthcare companies that are taking the pilot option I know that some of them from our research are trying different methods of triaging so this is just another method
Yeah, um, so they, they would be 10 to $20 each, but they would be reusable. And um, the bands could re be replaced for each person. Um, and it would, it would the cost would be less over time because instead of having to pay like trained EMTs to be doing the triaging, you can rely on the app and the biosensors to do it for you. And you can have a lot more untrained people on the scene. And then the trained people can focus on saving people rather than just the triaging process. Okay, thank you very much. Perfect. Take it away. Howdy, my name is Asher Stiak and we are the Aggie Collaborators. I'm an electrical engineering student in my junior year. I have Nathan here, he's a computer science uh, freshman, Perush, computer uh, engineer freshman as well. Uh, uh, Ruthie is uh, a yeah. com <laughs> computer uh, science uh, freshman. And finally, um, Muntahara, uh, she's an industrial engineer major, junior. Take it away. Okay, so our goal was to create a collaborative platform that used immersive technology to enhance efficiency, uh, improve productivity, and promote creativity. So what we found with our research was that one industry that took the greatest losses in miscommunication was the automotive industry. There were a lot of problems between the designer and the engineer and how they were talking to each other that created a lot of problems and uh, would, was the reason that the company faced a lot of losses. So as you can see, the golden screen exemplifies the problems faced by design, designers and engineers as they collaborate with each other. Even big companies like Toyota, as you can see on the screen, are facing this problem in the dynamic and the side effects lead to a, a lot of loss in money, lack of effectiveness, and even suppressing creativity of employees. So, uh, so as you can see, Designers and engineers approach problems very differently. Designers, they're, they're, they're in contact with the customers. They know what the customers think. They work, work with the aesthetics of the product. They want, they want to see the creativeness in the product. They want to imagine what they want to. Like they don't, they, don't, they don't have any limits. They are boundless. They want to do what they want to. So we often see this question come up with designers. Like, I want to implement this design. Why can't I? Engineers, on the other hand, have to see the practicality of the product. They need to see if it, if it is feasible enough to land into the market, if it is cost effective. They, we as engineers need to see if it, if it is even valuable for the, for the market. So that's, that's how the communication gap occurs between the designers and engineers. And this is where all the problems, ar problems arise from. So designers are basically, these are, they are just, concer they're just concerned with the aesthetics of the product. They're less, they're less concerned with the implementation. So that's where AC360 comes. And that's where we see our requirements come up. 
And so some of the requirements that we wanted to address when we were creating this product was a multi-user interaction. I want to be able to work with a group of designers and engineers all at the same time. We wanted global collaboration. I want to be able to collaborate with people in this room and people that are 10,000 miles away. And real-time communication. We wanted databases with multi-platform file sharing. So you and I have the same type of data and we can make better decisions. And we wanted virtual commenting on objects so we were able to track uh, we were able to track the object, and so when we're designing the car, we're able to track the car um, and it's uh, and the wheels or you know the gears to figure out what we've been changing and what's been happening uh, in the in the entire process of design. I'm going to talk about the three choices that we made while brainstorming about the product. So firstly, we had a choice where we had one person wear the VR and uh, make a 360 video and put it somewhere. But the limitation with this was, I could achieve this with a CAD model or a simulation. Why do I need VR for this? Uh, the other thing that we thought was, give VR to everyone. So everyone wears VR and is able to visualize, uh, visualize a model and uh, be able to play with it. Uh, that was a good idea, but uh, VR tends to, be, uh, tends to be uncomfortable on the long run. Professionals wearing VR, as you said, uh, for three or four hours meeting to meeting, that, that gets un uncomfortable. So we shifted to AR. AR allows you to be in your environment, in your room, with a holographic model created in, uh, created in your room. It's lighter on the eyes with the uh, top of the line HoloLens and uh, makes the experience more easier. So this is some of the market analysis that we did. As you can see, um, the, AR, the AR market is growing by 85%. Um, by 2022, or by 2020, we'll have $105 billion in the world, in the global AR market. The automotive industry takes up a big percentage of that. They take up around 12%. So $12.6 billion is invested from the automotive industry. And that means products like this have, uh, have demand and they have room to grow. So as we create this product, we'll be able to increase it um, in efficiency and improve it and we'll have people that want to buy this product. This is the video of us. Uh, so this is our video and this is how we uh, created our prototype. sleek aerodynamic design of this car and the uh, suspension looks pretty well aligned um, but let me check out the wheel maybe if I pull it out yeah look at that so it looks like the wheels axle is a little bit off this could cause some rotational issues huh let me take a look at this car you know I was really worried about the aesthetics of this car. I didn't really think about the functionality. Let's take it up. What do you think? Uh, yeah, everything looks pretty good. Uh, let me just uh, notate these changes for, uh, for your team to, to look at in the morning. Here, Here at, at AC360, 360, we're committed towards improving communication between designers and engineers. We are committed towards uh, engaging designers and engineers um, to collaborate together to promote productivity, enhance creativity, and um, create a Increase better working efficiency. world. Increase efficiency. So the solution that we came up with, as you can see in the video, it's a it's a it's an AR headset that uh, two people wear. Uh, they can be anywhere around the world. In this case, we were on two other floors. Uh, we could. Uh, visualize the same model, play with it, like uh, like she, she was lifting up the car, he was pulling up the wheel, you can uh, do various other things with it, and there's also a board, so the text gets translated to the speech and all the data for the specific part, in this case the wheel pops up, and you can, uh, that gets stored in the, to, into a database that's, that can be lose, uh, used later. Uh, this, help, uh, this helps uh, reduce training time, uh, the R&D costs, uh, the, redu uh, uh, the reduction, uh, in reduction of time, the design process, and also increases the work, worker productivity. It allows you to uh, be wherever you want and uh, do uh, and be able to do a, a lot of stuff. Uh, 
Also, one more thing. Uh, this this isn't limited to the uh, automotive industry. This can uh, be extended out to anything, including uh, in, including the military, where they need to analyze an, analyze uh, war fields before before battle, or even aerospace uh, industries where they need to analyze other uh, uh, physical models. I'm going to hand hand it over to Nathan, who is going to discuss innovation. Yeah, some of the big innovations that AC360 brings to uh, brings to the market is that it allows for enhanced communication. We support voice chat in the software and we support that text board so that you can send like text messages to the people and show notes and things like that. We also allow for a, a high level of transparency between the designers and the engineers. Uh, the Both can see everything that the other person is doing and when they make a change, it's notarized and saved, that build is saved to that database. And then those previous builds can be accessed at any time and looked at. Uh, it also allows the engineers and the designers to both get each other's perspective because the engineer can pull up like with a touch the specifications for the wheel and the designer with a touch can like look at the wheel rotate it, and they can both be talking and showing each other what they're doing and so having that communication can really add to the process. It's also built with long-term benefits in mind. Uh, because we're saving all the, all the previous builds to the database, we can use uh, like machine learning algorithms in the future to analyze that data and look at trends. So if people are spending too long on this one particular part, you can find that out and then modify your production for the next uh, for the next part. So another thing that um, another thing that really sets us apart is the fact that we're able to do everything remotely. We can work together in the same room and you know have this model pop up or we could work together from you know different environments. You could be in Tokyo, I could be here. And this really helps with people that are introverts. A lot of time when you're an introvert, you kind of, you're suppressed with your creativity. You don't want to tell people, you know, you, like you're traveling to Tokyo and like you, you don't feel comfortable in that environment. So you're not going to give as many creative inputs as you could do when you were in the comfort of your own, you know, area. And so that really helps with people that are introverts. And um, I guess like towards the end, it helps with the company because now your company is becoming more innovative because people are putting more inputs and we're enhancing efficiency and promoting creativity. And so that's really important when it comes to the numbers. Thank you for your time. We are AC360. Platform is open for questions. Thank you very much. Judges, you have five minutes for questions. Can you briefly restate why you guys chose AR over VR? Uh, we were advised that we were advised in the experience that VR takes you in a virtual world. So uh, you're cut off from the environment, uh, though it might be better to simulate the uh, world, but uh, when you're around in your room, you ha you're comfortable. Uh, the VR headsets are clunky, like brick like you said, uh, and it's, it's really difficult to be in the world. It causes uh, nausea and all sorts of stuff if you wear VRs for a long time. So it's impossible to work on VRs for a long time. It's fine for a game or two, but not a long time. AR instead is a glass that you can see through. It's just an image that's pro uh, projected on the glass. So it's, it seems like a hologram that's something in the room. So uh, it's lighter, uh, as with the HoloLens. Uh, HoloLens is an uh, AR, AR, AR uh, f produced by Microsoft. So it's lighter and uh, is forgiving to your eyes and uh, more comfortable to use with. And uh, can I add to that? Another reason that AR is better is because you can be working in the same room with a group of people and you'd be able to see them. And so that's really helpful because I'm like, obviously everyone's like, use Google Docs. Google Docs isn't just for when we're in different places, we can use it in the same environment and we're still more effective, more productive. And so really with AR, we're able to see each other and there's that you know human touch, we're able to work together. So a lot of companies, uh, there isn't any one company that, that has, you know, kind of launched a product like this into the market. There is a company that has been using VR with designers. Um, what they fail to see is the uh, disparity between the designers and the engineers and how they work, because there's a problem in that dynamic. And so there are, you know, companies, Boeing um, has, you know, has their internal engineers working on AR, VR systems, but that's a lot to do with internally in that system and they're more customized towards certain processes. So what we're doing is we're trying to target the automotive industry first and then maybe we can expand to uh, you know different uh, sources. And plus companies like Boeing, they aren't using collaboration in their work. It's just one engineer working with VR. 
we are using collaborative work, so that's where collaboration. So we want to bring people together. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. The next team is ProSure. One of the most common fears for the preoperative patient is the fear of the unknown. Even common sedatives for anxiety are harmful. Common anxiety symptoms include an irregular heartbeat, nausea, breathlessness, and sleep problems. If the lack of information is what causes all of these problems, then it's easy to believe that having the information would cure them. That's where procedure comes in. It is a trusted medium between doctors, patients, under the hospital to learn about procedures and what to expect from them. The aim is to build patient trust, encourage the need for information, and revolutionize the medical connectivity. Through a direct means. This platform creates convenience for users and professionals and is an easy to use user interface. Every time that we hear a sound coming from the bushes or we see an accident on the side of the road while we're driving by, we always look. And we may know that it might upset us or it might be rude to stare at people post-accident, but we do it anyway. Why? Because humans crave information. And because humans crave this information, they aren't able to be satisfied until they receive this information. Okay. So this is our project procedure and we're my name is Aditi Barnchell and I am a freshman and general engineering major. My name is Johan Ashtakar and I'm a freshman chemical engineering major. My name is Ramon Paulo Care. I am a freshman and in a general engineering major. My name is Shainil and I am an industrial engineering graduate student. And we're sure that by putting the words we've said and your thoughts into perspective, we know that having information is necessary for our own sake of comfort and also just, to, of course, to kill the cat. And with experience, if you, if any of y'all have gone through a medical procedure or have seen anyone go through a medical procedure, you know that there's a lot of stress involved both before and after the surgery. And according to the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, 
two thirds of patients go in their surgery uninformed and patients with anxiety are more likely to suffer more pain. With this lack of information and the desire for such, a question can be raised from this. Could there be a better medium, one that is simpler, easier to understand, uh, be implemented into solving this problem? And could it actually reduce the, any pre-surgical fear? And we, from Procedure, uh, want to come up with the answer, a loud and clear yes. We can have a medium which would help us deal with uh, pre-procedure as well as post-procedure fear and anxiety. We can reduce it and we can do it with our app, Procedure. So first we analyzed our need statement. So essentially, we all know that doctors provide a lot of visual and static models to show what exactly is going to happen in a medical procedure. But being able to see it like firsthand and being able to interact with it adds a lot more value to the product. And since the question was like, could AR or VR implementation affect and or enhance the effectiveness of pre-procedure walkthroughs, we believe that it is yes. And we do this by incorporating an app that is going to be able to show you animated 3D models of these procedures and what exactly is going to happen with two different aspects that we're going to talk about. For this reason, we develop these requirements. First, we need to compile complex information in the simple language that we can convey and also the complex medical jargon that people many of them most people would not understand our goal is to convey it in a simpler way so that even a simple person like let's just say an engineering major going into a surgery should be able to understand and second we are focusing on accessibility to all patients and that is why this is a platform between doctors and patients all controlled by the hospital third and probably most obvious uh, we we need to create visuals that would be pleasing to the eye but also still appealing and give a great understanding to of, of the procedure that goes through to <clears throat> next we would ensure in the industry that the, it would be constant monitoring and uh, <clears throat> evaluation by pro professionals in the actual field to ensure the quality of our product. And, but most importantly, the, the major initial goal is for it to grant the, pa grant the patient confidence, comfort, and security and their knowledge of the procedure that they will be going through and they can as well as their any knowledge of what to do at what to do after said procedure to ensure a quick recovery so that's why we came up with our app which is procedure uh, the app would be based off a uh, based off a smartphone and uh, we, we thought of it to uh, we thought to harness the uh, AR technology of, and just use the latest smartphones so that it becomes accessible for all people and the cost of uh, ownership is uh, brought down. The, uh, the main uh, purpose that we wanted the app to serve was to have fully functional animations that can explain uh, complex surgical procedures in simple terms. We also wanted the content to be moderated by medical professionals and the most importantly they should be able to uh, bookmark or I would say reference a particular point of time so that they can have questions which they can eventually uh, uh, visit their uh, physician and doctor and uh, get those addressed to. Now I would like to move on to the UI. Uh, the app uh, we have just created the user interface so uh, this is what we hope our app would look like. Okay, so essentially we're able to create a functioning app 
in which we have a video and an AR section and we can choose which one to access depending on need or what we're desiring at the moment to learn about because the video section of it shows just the animated procedure brought down in layman's terms and easy to understand for anyone but the AR part of it is actually interactive and we were able to like move around the parts and click on them for descriptions and we hope to further this in order to make it more interactive with more procedures possible for everyone. Although there are limitations to design with the in terms of graphics and what it can fully functionally do, we do we this I hope what we've said so far conveys our functionality that we hope to bring to the table. Essentially, what we are trying to do is simplify things not just for not just for the sake of the user but also for the sake of the doctor and the medical industry overall and also to add to that our product is unique because we not only add the section of AR because this is an unexplored area in medical fields like talking about the patient specifically there are means to help medical <coughs> students but patients are not able to use this technology to understand their procedures and this could we believe be a lot more helpful to patients who are suffering from anxiety to understand these models and AR would be the best means to do so because it reduces the cost a lot as uh, my partner said and it also enables them to not have to go anywhere but just use it from the comfort of their home and it's very feasible also, we're, we're attempting to, in the future, we're attempting to open our statistical database for, for medical research. And we hope to cater this for medical students and bring it in for engineering and veterinary students as well. Uh, we, uh, we are expecting that the hospitals would have the money to uh, help us with this app. So we would be charging the hospitals and the patients would be utilizing it just off the access code. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And judges, you have five minutes for questions. classification of uh, procedures which has been followed mm -hmm. so uh, a particular surgeon would uh, how, however they want to uh, perform the procedure uh, they would be the one giving the access code to the patients so uh, th there are a certain set of standardized procedures I, I forgot there is an international organization which would uh, standardize the, uh, the procedure that uh, the steps involved in it the diagnosis and uh, uh, what, what all uh, uh, there is a standard which is updated I think the latest revision is the 10th revision so uh, we, we, we intend to harness uh, those sta use of standards I'd like to add on to that and of course uh, we're going to be as we if we use this app we're going to be able to ask for the input of doctors and they can request special procedures to be made in the future and since the doctors are able to monitor and approve the procedures and like apply which ones they want in the selection of the patient that is given this app or they would be able to like standardize like what they want in the procedures not just any sort of procedure can you all state again who's paying for this there's a lot of content that we're talking about creating so you were just getting into that at the end Yes, uh, sorry, we ran out of time. Uh, uh, si since the cost of uh, development and the cost of getting professional uh, opinion, like, uh, advice from doctors would be very high, uh, uh, we intend to uh, uh, we intend to market it to the hospitals. The hospitals would be pay, uh, paying for the app. It would be uh, for the patient. It would be an app which can they down they can download it for free on their phones, and the hosp uh, the doctors would be providing the patients with a unique access code which would only redirect them to the procedure which is uh, specific to uh, the, the one which is uh, specific to the patient, the case, case by case basis. If you're going to use specific code, it's going to be an associated with 
Actually, we were focusing on not completely making this an open source database since like m most of the medical records and like data is considered private and we were, that's what our whole like issue with this whole thing was and that is what we were trying to deal with with the access code. So like that is the main thing I would say, that is the line between private and public and we intend not to open it to the public source soon. We would definitely go about taking like extra security measures such as having to log in through the hospital database and encrypting the information so that it cannot be like tracked to the individual. So we would definitely take those security measures if given the time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Break now. I'd like everyone to be back at 4:30, which is about nine, eight or nine minutes from now. So, if everybody will be back at 4:30, we will continue on with the last four presentations. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Do we direct? We're good. All right. Welcome back. We're going to go to do the second half of these presentations. I want to remind everybody that all the applications that you see and the presentations that you put together, as well as all the video, has all been accomplished since Friday afternoon. This is a period of 48 hours of very intense activity by the students who have been putting this together. So it is something that's short of amazing what they're able to accomplish in a very short period of time. So congratulations to everyone involved and now we're going to hear from Dr. Reality. Howdy, we're Dr. Reality and we're here to train medical professionals. I'm Strujan. I'm Matthew. I'm Kyle. I'm Dannon. I'm Lucas. I'm Mudden. And here's our video. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is an example of an endotracheal intubation, a common operation in the real world. With our simulation, we can practice this operation before the patient needs it. Errors in this field are the third leading cause of death. One in four medical professionals fail this procedure. Severe staff shortages are predicted. Despite the billions of dollars in the medical field, the world overall has a deficit of registered nurses. We do not see that problem as much here in the US, but in places like Africa and China, the problems lead to large amounts of hours worked by very few nurses. These places have as little as one nurse per 10,000 people. Money is wasted and patients suffer. Current medical professionals are trained using dummies for an intubation procedure. These dummies cost upwards of $40,000 each. VR can drastically lower this cost. VR can train nurses faster and more effectively. This is our prototype VR solution. I need scissors. Got it! Come on, faster, we're losing him. I'm coming, I'm coming! Faster! No, 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 we're losing him, we're losing him! There you go, good, good, good. Put it on. Ah, he's stabilizing. Hopefully with that small procedure at the very end, the patient was saved using a technique called endotracheal intubation. And what this is, is just to give you a brief snippet, is you use this metal scope, which is shown in the corner, called a laryngoscope. You open up the patient's airways, stick a tube into the trachea, and then pump air into their lungs because the patient is unconscious and won't be able to breathe on its own. And we do this, and we particularly chose this procedure mainly because this procedure is performed under a high stress environment and medical students aren't trained in this during their uh, medical school. And when medical schools come into the actual hospital and perform this, one out of every four fail. And this was shown in a study from the National Taiwan University Hospital. And to talk more in depth about this is Matthew. Okay. So how many of you know how to do CPR? And how many of you are confident that you could actually save someone's life doing CPR? It's a lot less people. As, you, as he just said, there's one in four people doing the intubation, they fail. So uh, medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the US and these could easily be prevented if we just had better training. So projected by 2025, there's over 100,000 uh, nurses that we'd be short of in the US and this is because lack of training spaces for hands-on experience such as uh, you saw in the video with our VR. So we could use that VR to overcome that. And it needs to be cost-effective, not only uh, save lives, but also save money. And we need to train these people quicker and more effectively. And we think that VR could have a better quality training than uh, things that they learn in the classroom needs to integrate uh, into uh, medical facilities easily, how they use shapes and colors to label like different sorts of medicine. So we do that and then uh, there's over a hundred different tools that uh, medical professionals use in one procedure, they can use up to a hundred. So we set that as a minimum for tools for people to use. And I'll hand it to Kyle for different designs. 
All right, so we came up with three different designs to achieve this purpose. The first one is augmented reality mixed with, with a dummy. We, we decided to have a, a physical dummy with cavities that are distributed all throughout the body filled with gel that can mimic flesh. We were then going to use AR to simulate the bones, veins, and ligaments, etc. throughout this body. We didn't choose it because in one, it's less immersive, and two, it's very based in the physical, which, requ which would require materials and space. Our next idea was using VR with dummy. I am, it's better than AR because we use um, less physical objects, but still it's kind of difficult to map uh, a physical object in a, in a virtual space. And it's still physical, we don't want that. With pure VR, I mean, we have no, no physical interactions, which is a drawback, we can't, test, we can't test muscle memory, but we can test pure knowledge, which is what, what we chose to do. I mean, and, and what you guys saw, the doctor was asking for different, uh, different tools and procedures to, to be done that can test the nurse's knowledge or physician on if they remember it and, wait, and if they can recognize what needs to be done. For our VR solutions, I'm going to hang it off to my friend Gannon. So uh, what Matthew talked about a lot was that you may think you know CPR, but when it actually comes down to it and you're in that high pressure situation, it's like you forget everything. So what we liked about VR was that we can constantly replicate and simulate that high stress environment while uh, still being able to uh, fail and see what your failures were, then um, fix them and repeat. And so, um, so like you could hear with the beeping, they, we had a uh, negative feedback that was depending on the performance. And um, then, yeah, and um, so we'll pass it off to uh, Srijan to talk about uh, why medical schools need this. So this is one of the biggest questions of why the medical schools would actually want this device. And it's mainly so that uh, you can get hands-on training to actually reduce medical errors because these errors are the third biggest lead or the third leading cause of death in America. And in addition, in medical schools, whenever they do these hands-on training, they use bodies called cadavers. And over the course of the year, found by the Anatomical Gift Association in Illinois, they saw that the suitable body donations fall from 1984 to 2015. And this is mainly because obesity is growing in America, and because of that, the bodies aren't that suitable. And we actually had a resident talk about this, saying that the bodies, they don't want to ship through all the fats of the body. So if we get VR and replacement of that, it can be very quick and easy to the process. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Lucas. Okay, so our VR system. It increases the accessibility of this training to nurse, nurses and colleges worldwide. You no longer need to have as many spaces to store cadavers. You don't need to pay for all the cooling costs, the maintenance costs for those cadavers, which can be very expensive because they're kept for five to six years. Try keeping a human body from deteriorating for those six years. Not easy. Uh, it increases the retention rate. So VR, you actually remember what, what you see you remember 75% of all that information, whereas if you're in a classroom and they're showing you, oh, here's this tool, you only remember that about 5% of the time. Reading helps, but nowhere close to VR. Uh, it's cost effective. Cadavers cost $3,600, like $1,300 for the embalming process, $2,300 for the actual cadaver itself. That's not including the amount of time and the amount of uh, personnel and the cooling that it takes to keep that cadaver for six years. Our VR system will cost more initially, and about we're guessing about ten thousand dollars for one system. Uh, we're not going to completely replace those cadavers. We're only going to replace probably twenty percent, because at this moment we are just assisting the nurses in working on those cadavers, so they know their tools and they can use their time more efficiently. Uh, in the future, we plan, or um, and we'll talk about that more, but. For now, the biggest thing about ours is that we, we can do that ETI, the, uh, the tracheal thing, and that is replacing a $40,000 dummy. So there's a, there's a big cost savings there. Okay, Manon, if you want to talk about the futures. Yeah. So we have only worked on this project for the past 48 hours, so which is like not a long time to work on a whole problem. So of course, we have some uh, basic ideas for like the future that we want to work on. So one of the major things is like we want to diversify our application. So we want to uh, have it uh, for doctors, 
for uh, nurses and like uh, the nurses should also be able to have access to more tools, uh, not just the ETI that, uh, that we simulated right now. Uh, another thing we want to do is like have a feedback mechanism. For example, like having a Fitbit that would basically monitor their heart rate and like give them feedback based on like at what times they were anxious and like so that they can work on those uh, timings and like the procedure they were doing at that point so that they can analyze the data and better uh, work towards that. Uh, that's about it and thank you all for paying attention. We will open up for questions. Judge, you have five minutes for questions. So there is, um, there's, a, there's a few medical VR implementations, but uh, it, I'd say it's split up into two. So there's one side that is all about the visualization of the, uh, the anatomy. You can go super in depth and see uh, the specifics. And the other side is uh, training for very specific uh, surgical procedures, stuff that you would have to travel far and wide or to a specific place to uh, learn about. And um, so uh, ours is more so replacing um, the lack of opportunities in med schools uh, combined with a high stress environment that replicates the real life experience that you would normally get. So what we're doing is not purely muscle memory. We're actually doing, we're training your mind is mainly the thing that we're doing. We're training you on your effectiveness and your knowledge on tools. So as a nurse, a surgical nurse specifically, you're helping the doctor who's asking you for tools, asking for help, making sure that you can uh, help him like quickly and get the right thing because you don't want to get him the wrong thing and then have to go back and get another because that, that time, especially when you're working in the ER, time where time matters the most. You don't want to don't want to have that problem. So we're not dealing with the the muscle memory part specifically because of you don't want that problem to uh, to occur on you. Uh, neither do we. So yeah. And to add on to that, what we were doing in our demo was for the nurse, for the surgeon, not the surgeon specifically. So they're just yeah. getting tools like like they said. There's over there could be a hundred tools in a single procedure. So you need to know what's what and what you need to get and be able to get it quickly for the doctor that's performing the actual surgery. So if we were to expand this to actual doing surgical procedures like other companies have, then we'd more likely use AR so you can get your muscle memory down. Okay, thank you very much. And the next team is Phobia.
take it away. Howdy. Howdy. We are Team Phobia. I am Chris Schomer. I am Nam. I'm Hamza. I'm Shala. I'm Mariah Chavez. I'm Linda Bustamon. Please enjoy our video. So, show us what you've got. Hi everybody. This is the great down, I'm sorry, um, breakdown of my team's progress over the last three months. Oh, my hands are so sweaty. Why is everyone looking at me like that? Is my face sweaty? This is so bad. I'm never going to get that promotion. Gosh, I'm boring them. I'm even boring myself. Wait, where was I? Are you afraid of public speaking? Chances are, you are. It's the most common phobia, and one that is necessary to tackle. It affects your ability to reach upper-level management and even your wage. Traditional methods of trying to overcome glossophobia are expensive and not an option for everyone. With our virtual reality training system, you can overcome your fears. Other virtual reality simulations have tried to help users overcome glossophobia, but have only had a 40% success rate. Phobia uses classical conditioning and biofeedback to have an increase in success rate. Once you're done with the session, the app lets you know how you did and what you can do to improve. Okay, let me ask you a question. How many of you in the audience have a fear of public speaking? Actually, I have. I always try to overcome this fear, but it's not easy. It's really hard. So, however, there is a solution for you. The cost of treating anxiety and phobias is uh, 42 billion per year. Most of us, 50 million people have suffered from glossophobia on a daily basis. Some research have shown that Virtual reality can be a solution for this, but there are still remains many challenges and limitations. Today, to meet these requirements and beyond previous solutions, we are going to propose a novel solution, which has three critical features. Initially, when we were brainstorming different ideas to come up with solutions, we came up with three main points. One is biofeedback. Another is classical conditioning, and the third is audio recognition. So, how many of you, when you when you came up here, you could feel your heart beating faster? Raise your hands, please. I know I did, if I'm honest. Um, so, essentially, what this does is it monitors your heart rate, and it can show progression over time. So, if you're using the app, at first you would think that oh, hearing my heartbeat or seeing my heartbeat increase will be a snowball effect. That's true. But then over time, you'll get used to it. And then you, give real, you get real-time feedback, and it lets you know how fast your heart is beating. And then you can see progression over time on how successful you are in overcoming your fears. A second point is that it analyzes your speech patterns. So we have in the app a way to listen to your speech, listen to voice quavering, intonation changes, pauses, ums, anything like that. And give you real-time feedback and let you know how you're doing. Now, when it comes to this kind of app, there are a lot of ex systems that already exist. The issue with these systems, though, is that they all focus on trying to tackle public speaking, and it leads them to miss some certain points. For instance, a lot of them require users to have very expensive headsets for virtual reality, such as Ovation, the most popular one, but not everyone can afford a monthly subscription or such an expensive headset. But other apps like Be Fearless, even though they are, mo are effective, are, do not include mobile aspects. And other ones such as Virtual Speech also are lacking a feedback system. So our app is going to take care of all of those as per to meet all of our requirements. Our team built a physical prototype, fully functional physical prototype, as you can see on the screen. Once the user click on the app, it will be given three different scenarios. Suppose uh, we uh, click on Auditorium. So the user, so the user will be first asked to stretch, which is gonna help him to practice better during the uh, practice time. So once he's do, he he did that, he practiced. After he's done, he gonna give uh, the app will generate the result based on the performance. 
first it will be given the positive feedbacks then the user will be told like what specific areas he need to fix and how he can fix it now linda will talk about the demo as you can see we have biometric data given in real time we have the uh, speech and you're able to see the pitch the volume the number of filler words such as um or like we also have heart rate now this heart rate will be input from um, a fitness tracker we also have a recording, we will record the amount of rotation you do so that we can determine whether or not you're giving enough eye contact to the audience. Now, a major part that we're going to do in order to make our app different from other apps is we have to analyze a problem that exists when apps use VR to solve this. In general, trying to treat phobias with VR does have a 40% success rate initially, but there are actually, they are currently doing methods of research where we've discovered that getting more cases of your body involved will make you actually conquer your fear more likely and for a longer period of time. We found a classical conditioning approach that we see has been able to prove that 40% rate to up to 71%, depending on the person and their age. So by using this, we're able to make our app different than other apps. Our production costs include the uh, programmers who will be able to make the app. We need equipment such as the Google Cardboard that the phone will go into. We need fitness trackers. We also need the cost of marketing such as advertisement. And we also need partners. Now that you've seen how immersive our uh, app is, here is how it is cost efficient for our target consumers, such as psychologists who can use our app on their patients for exposure therapy, um, corporations who could use our app on their employees for uh, procedural purposes, and um, educators who can use our app on students for classes such as English and or public speaking. As far as marketing goes, we want to promote our app through social media websites such as Snapchat or Facebook. And we also want to attend conventions such as medical conventions to get one-on-one -on -one, uh, with psychologists and corporations. Our app will have a free and a pro version. The free version will be uh, downloadable on the App Store for anyone as long as we get the individual's consent to use their data for our research purposes. The pro version will be for professional use. Uh, they will have a one month free trial. For example, um, once the uh, free month trial ends, psychologists will be able to have a, a 3,000 yearly fee. Corporations will have a $5,000 yearly fee for every 500 employees. And educators will have a three, also have a $3,000 yearly fee. Now when it comes to our product, we were able to not only find a, make a working prototype, but we were also able to develop our own haptic sy system that is capable of giving the vibrations necessary to make the app more effective than current markets, current products on the market. But not only that, we plan on being able to make a smaller version of that, possibly the size of a pin, that is capable of creating the vibrations necessary for a user to be able to remember the information much longer, the information that they learn much longer than the apps that currently exist. In addition to that, we also plan on focusing on schools but at first, so that we can make sure they can see our classical conditioning and prove that it actually works on a larger audience. By doing so, we are able to address all issues that our product has for, all issues that our product demands us to solve for our requirements, but also have potential for making an audience that the future could see to solve not just speaking phobias, but all phobias all around that affect behavior. And so who are we? We are phobia. Our mission statement is to reduce social anxiety by exposing users to their fear via a virtual reality experience. Now, our ask is for $60,000 to develop an app within the next six months. Thank you. Thank you. Judges, you have five minutes for questions. everyone use smart like watches and Fitbit so it can just connect with Bluetooth. It's, so you don't really need to buy one. It and so when we're looking at different types of technologies, it doesn't necessarily have to be a Fitbit. There are cheaper options that might not work as well, but they do still work. I looked at prices and you can get like a heartbeat monitor for as low as $10, for example. How does your price compare to your competition? When we look at, oh, when we look at ovation, they have about like... Um, $20, $20 per month, ovation. 20. But we are free. Yes. So $20 per month, that's the lowest fee for individuals. Our lowest fee is for free. 
with ads, of course, to generate re revenue. And using the data in order to complete further research. Mm -hmm. So how are you protecting the data since there's obviously Oh, we will we will uh, collect the personal identifier of data, just demographic or data. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we don't care. You don't even need to put in your name, for example. We don't care about that. We just care about, you know, like your age, your height, to generate like BMI, something like that. You could optionally do that just to generate like a resting heart rate, for example. That way you have some level of basis for um, the research. For the future, how we can upgrade and all that. Fix the problem. It's mainly of interest because currently a lot of schools are creating system school are creating systems that focus on doing research in HCI and and product design and development. And they could use feedback and research about things like how people would respond to using a vibrotactic sensor inside place of how inside place of how their product can be used and received inside the real market. So, for example, I don't know if everyone knows what classical conditioning is, but there were some major studies done and. If you ever have to take a test and you're studying, if you chew gum while you're studying for that test and you go and take that test and you're not chewing gum, you don't perform as well. The same can be said like with music. If you listen to music um, while you're studying for the test and you don't listen to music while you take the test, you're not going to do as well. So that's what that is. We plan on using some sort of device. It could even be your phone, a pen, something like that, that vibrates when you're using the app to let you know how you're doing. And then you can use the app like without the VR, just have it in your pocket and it can vibrate, letting you get that same feedback that you're used to. And that's how you can connect the two. No other company has done that. Okay, thank you very much. The next team is VizMat. Y'all could come up here. Okay, take it away. Okay, howdy, my name is Jacob Warner and I'm a junior computer science major. I'm Nicholas Anderson, I'm a junior computer engineering major. I'm Natalie Cargill and I'm a junior mechanical engineering major. I'm Ray Matsuda, I'm a freshman as a computer science major. I'm Henry Weinstein, I'm a freshman aerospace engineering major. And together we're BizMat and we prepared a lecture to introduce you guys to material science. Today we will learn about crystal structures. Let's start with the face-centered cubic structure. As we all know, each unit cell of a face-centered cubic crystal structure has an eighth of an atom in each of its corners and half of an atom on each face. By examining the FCC plane from side view, we can see that its stacking sequence structure is composed of three distinct layer patterns labeled A, B, and C. Are you ready for your exam? Imagining anything on an atomic level is already extremely difficult, and when your coursework gets more complex, it becomes apparent that traditional ways of teaching are just not satisfactory. Many can attest that these types of structures cannot be taught with just lectures and diagrams. A traditional way to solve this problem is to construct a physical three-dimensional model, much like this one that we 3D printed. However, this is very rigid and it's not very interactable. So what you could do is construct an old-fashioned ball and stick model. All it takes to make this bad boy is 14 styrofoam balls, a whopping 44 toothpicks, it's going to take about an hour and you're going to wind up with a ton of splinters. 
So basically, these models are both inefficient and limited. In Vizmat's VR workspace, you can manipulate the model in various ways unique to the virtual world in order to gain great intuitive understanding of the structure at hand. All this will be very accessible to the students. And if you're already going to the store to get some arts and crafts, then you might as well pick up some cardboard while you're there. Okay, so our problem that we're trying to solve is actually threefold. First of all, the complex 3D structures can be intimidating as well as hard to understand unless they're taught in an intuitive way. Secondly, students tend to lose, an in to lose interest in the topic if they're not taught with new and engaging technology. And lastly, students that are taught less effectively end up being less marketable to employers, which in the end hurts both the students as well as uh, the learning institutions. So we base our solution um, on the basis that lessons that are supplemented with virtual reality have been shown to increase student retention confidence in the material that they do learn, and satisfaction with the learning experience overall. And so our design had three main requirements. Firstly, it has to be able to effectively teach these uh, confusing 3D concepts and uh, using a dynamic and an interactive virtual reality environment. Uh, secondly, it needs to be accessible to students, which means affordable. Uh, so we wanted it to be under $15 and to be able to operate with virtually any smartphone. And lastly, it also needs to be accessible to the instructors. Um, we all know how um, valuable and limited the professor's time is, so it needs to have a very efficient content creation system, as well as a way to distribute that to students easily. When brainstorming our idea, we first came up with this tile-based kit, where students would purchase a kit of cardboard tiles that would then, in AR, have atom atomic structures projected above. So you could form sort of Lego creations with that. However, there's a limitation there, and that's that it doesn't bring much benefit over the rigid structured models, because you can't really experience it in all of what VR can bring. So we next explored potentially exploring it in VR, right? So we eliminate the physical limitations. However, we would still build the models with the tiles. We then realized the tiles are the biggest limiting factor. Therefore, our solution ended up in full VR. Models would be downloaded, and explored in VR only. Our product would be a supplement to lecture. Professors might explain a, a structure while students are picking apart that structure in, three, in VR, therefore allowing for a greater understanding and matching that with the instruction itself. So we understand that uh, the time that we allot to students is just as important for the instructors. So we have uh, decided to invent a website which would use a widget that would allow uh, an easy and efficient way for instructors to easily create models that they can share with their students. And the students can uh, explore these models in our VR app. So this website, as you can see, uh, the widget is in the center. Uh, currently our instructor is uh, using Atoms, uh, a piece for our face-centered um, cubic structure. Um, basically what they're doing is taking the atom and dragging and dropping it into a layer that they have chosen already. Um, these pieces will be in a, a directory that can be added to by uh, multiple different people, instructors, students, um, professors as well. Um, we will also have another directory which will consist of completed models um, which can be added to again by students, professors, and instructors. Um, uh, we call those models mats. Uh, so we, they would access our mat directory and they could use those to supplement their lessons or they could use them to create their own ideas. Um, once they have uh, finished and are satisfied with what models they have, um, they will save and upload it and our uh, widget will automatically upload it to our cloud server. So once the instructors are done creating these models and uploading to the server, all students have to do is bring the models back down into their app and mess around with it in their VR environment. So now, the VR, the VR environment allows the students to interact with the models in ways that they could have in the traditional learning environment. So for example, you can disassemble the model, you know, move the atoms around and look at the inner structure of the crystalline structure and get a better understanding of how the atoms interact, interact with each other and see why the structures are how they are. You can also mess around with the, uh, with the size of the atoms itself and see how the structures are actually modeled within itself and also the angle of the actual crystal structures, so you can see the different angles. 
So now you're asking yourself, well, what's different between this and like a basic kind of ball and rod kind of structure in real life? Well, the thing is, the ball and rod structure is very rigid and it's very static. And so we know that, well, we found out that the solution to higher education is going to be VR. Because VR allows a platform that has a more dynamic and flexible model that the students can use as their advantage. So as you can see up here in the image, we have the uh, atoms called in red, green, and blue. And that, diff that basically shows the uh, layers of the crystalline structure, and those play into the packing of the crystalline structures, which we'll not really go into today, but they will go into that. So the VR allows us to be or allows us to display the data in a more advantageous way for the students to understand the, uh, I guess, the material needed to cover in the class in a better way. And the biggest portion or the biggest function that VR allows us to do is have a room scale crystalline structure viewer. So that is the image of that. And basically the student pretty much goes inside of the crystalline structure and they can look at the structure from the inside out. And this is not possible if it weren't for VR. And this allows the students to understand the complex structures. A good example is going to be steel. So steel is basically, it's carbon infused into iron atoms, and that is not easily understood if you're just looking at a model and kind of like a 3D world or just kind of like a paper. So you kind of got to go into there and see how the atoms actually interact with each other. And we basically think that VizMath is going to be the solution for higher education and understanding complex theories and concepts in the STEM classes. All right, so the big question we have to ask ourselves is why? Why should we create this, and why should you be interested in it? Well, for starters, education already encompasses a huge market, and we all know that student debt is a huge problem in America, and, um, <clears throat> and because of this, there's a strong demand from parents, students, teachers, and most importantly, universities to get their hands on the best tools. Um, Another thing that is the reason why Vizmat's time is now is because we're starting to see the demographics in college shift. So we're starting to see um, um, students that were born in Generation Z enter colleges, and they're different from their millennial counterparts because they've been exposed to advanced technology um, basically throughout their entire lives. Um, so for this reason, this could attract um, more students if, say, a college has um, VR capabilities. And for their current students, it will increase their performance and motivation. Okay, so big picture, um, this is not just restricted to crystals. This could be a multidisciplinary um, learning tool that can um, that basically can be expanded into potentially the industrial field. So, say a worker has to um, maybe get a better understanding of their CAD model. Um, Forbes, according to Forbes, in 2016 alone, over 100 million units of VR were sold, and 96% of that was Google Cardboard. Um, so the future is VR, and it's time for us to visualize a reality where Vizmat is in classrooms all across the country. Uh, we also have a demo um, prepared, so if, anyone wants, if anyone's interested uh, after the presentation, so you can come by us, and we have a Google Cardboard and our phones. Thank you very much. Judges, you have five minutes for questions. biology, we would expand the atomic structure to greater depth, right? So you, instead of having just atom to atom connections, mm -hmm. you could have molecule to molecule connections. We can model that all behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. As far as how it expands beyond chemistry, essentially, mm -hmm. you could build different functionality. So say, instead of selecting an atom, we select a gear. This interactability is the main focus so that other models could be explored in a similar way, taking apart, getting different angles. That's the big focus. And to add on to that, students learn by doing things hands-on. So it's not just in STEM classes, but it's in any class where you can pretty much do things hands-on and the students will learn better and it will retain their information more because of that. Did you 
video we were talking, I was trying to figure out if this is like a, you know, a solution in search of a problem. Like, is this, so I asked you, well, is there, are there not any other products out there that do this right now in these material science classes? Right, so solutions in VR education, essentially, are focused mainly in, you know, younger audiences, not necessarily teaching this advanced atomic structures. So our focus is in really allowing the maximal interactability to really gain the most intuition, not necessarily making it the most fun, as other solutions are based on. And also a big focus is keeping it accessible. So using the Google Cardboard or any similar, you know, less than $15 solution allows it to be applicable to large college applications. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the final team of the session is um, Best Fit. If y'all will come forward, please. Howdy. Howdy. We are best fit. I'm Nick. I'm Lucas. I'm Ruby. I'm Victor. I'm Louise. never see the fit. That's where Best Fit comes in. We are an app-based solution to problems plaguing retailers and consumers alike. Returns. 75% of online returns in 2016 were clothing, costing both retailers and customers time and money. With Better Fit, you get a simple, social solution to online clothes shopping. Once you put in basic measurements, we create an avatar of your unique body. We've got easy features to keep you connected. Like saving outfits you like to your profile, creating a wish list, and sharing your avatar to others to help them shop for you. Link your profile to retail websites and Facebook and get feedback from others about your style. Using our augmented reality system, visualize your avatar in the world around you and look at them from different angles. Browse through catalogs, get feedback on your sizing, and hear suggestions from us to find the perfect outfit for you and the ones you love. Style to your body with the best fit. So our need statement was, despite the rise of e-commerce, a lot of consumers are really wary about buying clothes online because they're not sure how they're going to fit, and so a lot of them end up going to retail stores. And so we're trying to solve this using augmented reality. Our mission statement is we are trying to bridge the gap between online and in-person shopping, bringing the ease of online with the comfort of in-person. So this is a big chart with a lot of numbers, but the most important one is to notice the big red arrow that's pointing upwards. From 2016 to 2021, the US apparel e-commerce industry is going to grow to $99.1 billion in just 2021. 
It's also important to note that 75% of returns in 2016 were clothing. And so that's a lot of money when it comes to $100 billion. This is Sears Tower, or what used to be Sears Tower. And Sears is an Amazon Prime example of why companies, <laughs> why companies need to focus and move towards e-commerce. Sears used to be the largest clothing retailer in the United States, and now they're bankrupt. So our design requirements are simple. We need to utilize the art to create an engaging experience that's fun for people. We need to connect to social media and get people to enjoy the app that they're using. We want to integrate with existing retail, re retail websites and apps because there's already an infrastructure created by all these retail companies that we can utilize. And you want to require five basic measurements to create an avatar. Of course, you can customize the avatar even further, but we want to really have a personal avatar that people can see as themselves. And you want to have the ability to share user profiles with others. This is important because, especially during the holiday season, husbands, wives, parents, friends, family, they, don't, they want to get a good gift for their loved ones, but a lot of the time if they get clothes, they don't fit. And so most of the time, they won't even try and get clothes anyways. Before diving in, we considered three design concepts. Our first one was an AR mirror that had a screen behind it. So when we walked in front, it automatically fitted the clothes to your body. We decided that this used too much infrastructure and it had already been done before, with little success. Second, we decided uh, to think about a VR uh, dressing room. However, this would be too much of a hassle for consumers as they'd have to go through the struggle of using a VR headset. Then we landed on our AR social app, Best Fit. Best Fit is able to take in your measurements and design a model uh, to your dimensions that allows you to try on clothes from your mobile device. So what exactly makes Best Fit so innovative and why did we choose this solution? Best Fit heavily uses social media to increase customer attraction and engagement by connecting people to people and people to clothes. You only need your phone. There is no need for a VR headset, there's no need for an AR mirror, there's no need for additional cost or infrastructure. It is easily in integratable into retail websites and apps uh, from existing retailers. And of course it's mobile. So the product we ended up developing is Best Fit. It brings fitting rooms into your hands. Um, we start with a login page, so you can create your account, you add your basic measurements, and from there we create a close enough mesh and you're able to add more measurements to make it look more like you. And then you get a 360 view of your avatar and you're able to browse cutting edge fashion and our partner sale uh, shops to find new fashion. So anytime you're shopping at any of our partners online stores, such as Kohl's, you could pick your size and then log into our Best Fit app using your code that's generated every time you make an account. So it, creates a rendering of what you would look like wearing that particular article of clothing. And see here we have our model Jane and she's trying on a small shirt and she put in her mom's QR code so she could see how her mom would look if she used that shirt. See how her mom is a little bit different structure. And then using the back arrow she's able to go back into her model and see other sizes how they would fit and she could try on all of them and see which one's the best one. See there, she tried on an extra small, and depending on her taste, she could like the tighter fit or the looser fit and create a decision on what to buy based on those metrics. So, um, for the future of our app, it's, it is very important to keep our users engaged and also try to, new, to reach new uh, bigger user base. So, a very important factor of the app will be shareability. And especially, well, as we have discussed, uh, the best link, we, uh, the best kit link. We want to allow users to share with their with their net uh, their the, uh, the link that will that will be an username. And if they give consent, uh, their family, their their net will be able to use that avatar to see uh, if the clothes they are going to buy to them fit or not. And they can do that online or even in the store. Maybe they are in the store and they have three sizes to choose and they don't know what, what, which one fits. So um, with, this, with this solution, now they can. We solve that big problem. And something, um, another important social factor on the, on the app is that 
now we allow users to share their outfits, for, for example, something that they are trying, they can, they feel proud, they can show them, they can show it on social media, and so other people can see it. And, and finally, we this is a very big opportunity for ret for traditional retailers to share their models, their clothes online, so everybody can try them virtually, even even if they are not going to buy them. And that could be also a very good strategy, advertisement strategy for fashion for fashion events, for fashion events where um, people are wearing really weird, well, weird. Uh, <laughs> special dresses, and I mean, it, it, it could be, it could be kind of fun and engaging to people. Even, and that could give us um, like this platform. Well, this platform, uh, we they could use us uh, our best paid up to to better their service. And so my uh, our business model is that we're gonna our market is gonna be to middle aged and young adults because they use social media and also they're the biggest users of um, online shopping and so that's why we're gonna target them but our app is easy enough for all other demographics to use it too so it's very versatile and also who who else is gonna want to buy this also retailers and not just major retailers small mom and pop shops want to buy it because it's going to help them to have a better place on the online market and so they can be more productive. Now at the end you're going to see why is this so important. You've seen through our presentation that this is a great idea. It'd be something fun to use. But I want you to imagine next year at this very time you're looking for a loved one's gifts and instead of having to ask them and figure out what should I get them, you pull up Best Fit and you put in their, their QR code and you can get what they would like in their size and know that it's going to be the perfect fit. So this is our product. Are there any questions? Judges, you have five minutes for questions. So who else in the industry is doing this somewhere out in the avatar? Well, it was very interesting. There was a company that did try this. It was called uh, Trimir, but they weren't very successful because when they created it, it was as difficult as a person who's not an engineer to try to use AutoCAD. And so um, that's why they failed. But with our app, we've made it easier and also more interactive by adding social media elements to integrate to apps people are familiar with. And also, it's not a 3D avatar, but Bitmoji does something very similar where you take the time to customize, you have your own little character, you can put clothes on it, and you share it with your friends, it integrates well with other apps. So it's sort of similar to that, but 3D and more useful. I'm actually too old to discuss the kind of the potential third rail for some folks, their nightmare would be 360 image of themselves on social media. Uh, so, <laughs> how it's, so some people, they may want to use this, they want to give the, their code to friends and family, but they may not want that broadcast for all to see. So, of, all talk about that? of course, the uh, social media aspect is totally optional. Maybe you want to post on social media, hey guys, look at this cool outfit that I made, what do you guys think, what are your thoughts on it? But of course, it's totally optional. It's not a forced sort of thing, and the link for um, accessing another person's model is totally separate from the sharing to Facebook, Instagram sort of uh, part of the app, and so you can keep it totally secure, totally personal, and the sharing is just a fun way to interact with the user base. And much like most social medias, if you're on private mode, people are gonna have to request every time they try to use your, your code. So like, if your mom wants to use it once, she could use it and then she could use it after that because you gave her permission. But a random person can't just generate your code and see your avatar. Oh, mm -hmm. and in our business model, we also plan to have like IT security, so that way we can encrypt our information, their information to protect it. Um, the content that has been given for the for that link can be revoked at any time. And one way to overcome this uh, body shaming thing would be like you can only visualize the avatar with some clothes on. You cannot see the avatar uh, naked. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's a possibility. Change your shape. Yeah, that could be really scary. Yeah. 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 And then also, we're trying to stay away from body scans because that's your real body. So it's like 
a created version of you, and you get to create it. So it does look like you, but it's not your body. So it's not an invasion of privacy. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, this completes the presentations for this evening. The judges are going to finalize their scores, and we're going to be audited by Pricewaterhouse Cooper. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we're going to be putting it on a mason jar on the on the counter, and then we will be pulling things out like that. And what we're going to do is we are going to then retire and go uh, next door and choose the winners. Uh, I think we would also like to get everyone here to have a group shot. So if everyone will come back up here, uh, Kim will put together a group shot for us. And then when we come back, we will award the winners. Thank you very much. And we will step right across the hall.
Sit so down, please. Okay, uh, congratulations to everyone who finished and survived this marathon. I know it seemed like a marathon, and I appreciate that. And, Kate, and Katie, I assume we're up, we're up. Is that correct? Good. Um, all right, thanks again for everybody. The judges had an incredibly difficult time. Uh, there, everyone is amazed at what you've been able to accomplish in this very short period of time. So congratulations to everyone. I also want to remind you that we are engineering entrepreneurship. And I highly encourage each and every one of you to consider taking this project to the next level. We are here to help you. We have an incubator upstairs. We'll have access to more free resources than you ever will again to create a startup in your career. We have coursework, we have mentors, we have everything necessary for you to continue developing this product. And we will help you all along the way. So please consider moving things along please consider joining our activity and our, our effort. We have an incubator upstairs, y'all were in it to the VR area, so you got a chance to see it. So congratulations to everybody. I know everybody wants to get out of here so you can continue studying, because that is what you are here for, to graduate with degrees. We are trying to make you a better version of yourself so that when you get into the industry, that you will remember the things that we have been teaching you here. Congratulations to everyone again. The YouTube is up online and you can review it this evening. So without further ado and stop talking, Mr. Bain, please finish. All right, so the third place team, and this is a team that will win $500. By the way, we're going to be giving you blue checks. You can take pictures with them. You cannot cash them. I would like them back, please. And you'll see the money show up in your student account as scholarship money. That's how the money will show up. The third place team is Vizmat. Come on up, please. take a few more pictures afterwards if you'd like to. All right, the uh, second place team and winner of $750 for the team is Best Fit. Please be sure you turn back in anything that you borrowed from the uh, FEDC and make sure that you are uh, have all of your stuff. Every now and then people will leave chargers and things like that in the FEDC and it's difficult for us to make sure that we've got them back. So let's please make sure that you've got this all back. Now the first place team, winner of $1,000 as well as Dell laptops. And this must have something to do with um, Aggie's invent because the winning team is Phobia. Oh, <laughs> 
little more. For the story, of course. Congratulations. And thank you very much for everyone who participated. You picked up tremendous life uh, skills this weekend. Please continue on. Think about Invent for the Planet. Think about engaging us in terms of engineering entrepreneurship. We look forward to engaging with you at all times. And have a great finals week. And may you get the grades that you deserve. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Are you a